Hi, it's Tom Stokely, reading from John 5, verse 1 to 15. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, in Aramaic, is called Bethesda, Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One of one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in his condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me out into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day in which this took place was a Sabbath. Was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who has been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat? The man, who, the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for doing an amazing reading. Uh, it's great to have the opportunity to be together today, to be looking at God's word together. Can I just say, we've really had a sense as we've been praying uh, this morning in particular, that the Lord really wants to do some significant stuff in our lives. And uh, we've had a real sense that God wants to do something in terms of bringing some healing into our situations and into our circumstances at the moment. So can I encourage you, I, I know that you normally do pay close attention, but can I especially encourage you this morning to put down any distractions and focus, because we have a real sense that the Lord is wanting to speak something really specific into individual circumstances. So we need to make an extra effort. I know it's easy when we're at home, it's easy to get into a passive mode. Can I encourage you to be really, really closely engaged because we wanna flow where the Holy Spirit wants to take us today. And we've got a real sense that God wants to do a significant work in a number of people's lives. So as I say, put down all the distractions and the deflections, let's focus in on Jesus. And we're continuing today, it's the third week of our at the Jesus Way series. It's one of my favourite series because uh, simply what we're doing in the Jesus Way series is we're looking at some gospel stories and we're seeing how Jesus did life and hopefully from that gleaning some of the ways that we need to be doing life in what is quite an extraordinary season for us all. Um, our key verse is from Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30 where Jesus says this, he says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And even now, just as I'm reading that, do you notice the number of times that Jesus talks about rest? and finding rest for your souls. And just had a sense that for some of us this morning, we just need to let go of some stuff and kind of take a deep breath and breathe in God's peace and breathe in God's rest. And even in the midst of an extraordinary season with a lot of uncertainty around us, it's possible to live out of God's rest. In fact, we were made to live out of God's rest. If you remember the creation story, it was on the seventh day of creation of God's activity that he rested, but actually man was only made on day six. And so the first day that man was alive on the earth, he rested and he worshiped God. And it was that sense of rest and peace that man was made to live out of into then the everyday activity. And I feel like for a number of us, God's saying today, just rest 
create some space, receive my love, receive my rest. And today we're going to be looking at uh, dealing with our history the Jesus way. If you remember last week I spoke about dealing with fear the Jesus way. Today is a connected talk in many ways to that and you'll uh, pick up if you've watched last week's uh, live stream then uh, you will uh, hopefully go on a journey into this week's Um, if you haven't you'll still understand this week's I promise Uh, but it might be helpful to look at last week's last week we're looking at dealing with fear the Jesus way this week we're looking at dealing with our history the Jesus way and we're taking that story that the canons covered so wonderfully earlier uh, uh, the healing at the pool in John chapter 5 verses 1 to 15 just a couple of things about the context of that story because to understand the bible we really 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 really, really, really need to put it in context. And we need to check because often it's the little things in the passage that are key to understanding the main story. In John's gospel, there's seven miracles that are particularly uh, outlined. There's seven signs. And it says at the end of the gospel that these signs are there that you might believe in who Jesus is. This is the third sign. The first one is the turning of the water into wine. We all like that sign, didn't, don't we? Who wouldn't mind uh, uh, Jesus coming and turning water into wine? Um, secondly, there's the healing of the uh, official's son, which happens in John chapter 4. The third healing is, is the third sign is then this healing that happens in John chapter 5. Only occurs in John's gospel. So seven signs in John's gospel to reveal who Jesus is. This is sign number three. Also seven feasts in John gospel and uh, this is uh, this event happens at one of the feasts as well why does John outline that because all of the feasts of the Old Testament everything that was celebrated in the Old Testament whether that's God's provision whether uh, that's God's cleansing and God's purifying uh, all of those things are fulfilled in Jesus and so again John is pointing us towards Jesus Uh, this story only happens it's only recorded in John's gospel and it's a healing that happens at a pool called Bethesda now what's really interesting about this is for years and years and years the archaeologists couldn't find the pool of Bethesda and so there was kind of a question mark I guess in some ways over this story because they couldn't locate it even though in the passage it says quite clearly where the pool of Bethesda was but what is amazing is in in the mid 19th century then archaeologists dug a little bit deeper in Jerusalem and they found the pool of Bethesda Uh, which is really exciting and what they found was they found two pools next to one another with a colonnade so with porches just like John outlines in his story and the lower pool was uh, what was called a mikveh so it was a place that the Jewish people would go to have a ritual cleansing but the upper pool that was separated by a wall with the colonnades in with the porches in the upper pool was uh, renowned to be a place of healing and because it was renowned to be a place of healing it was a place where the lame and the paralysed and the unclean would hang around. Now, in Jewish society at the time, if you were lame or disabled, it was viewed as being God's judgment upon you. I don't actually think that is true, um, but it was viewed as being that. And so actually, it would represent in many ways a pool of disgrace and a place that no one would want to be. And yet that's the very place where Jesus is happy to go. And the name Bethesda actually literally means, it means house of mercy or house of grace. And isn't it lovely that Jesus goes to people who felt judged, marginalised, outcasts, were in pain and suffering, and Jesus makes that place, he transforms it into a place of mercy and a place of grace. How are you doing this morning? How are you feeling this morning? Stuart prayed at the very beginning, didn't he, about being honest and vulnerable. How are you really doing? You know, if we were in church physically meeting together, which I really miss, But if we were physically meeting together, we'd be able to say to one another, how are you doing? And often on Sunday morning, there isn't actually the opportunity for a deep conversation. So most of us would probably just say fine. But actually, how are you really doing? How are you really coping? Are you really coping? Maybe you feel like you're not coping in this season as well as you would like to. Maybe life is weighing down heavily on you. Maybe you feel burdened. Maybe you feel a sense of failure. Do you know, Jesus wants to come near and make this time a house of grace and a place of grace and a place of mercy 
where we can drink in deeply of his presence. And this is what one guy finds at the pool of Bethesda, the place of the house of mercy, the house of grace. And this guy, interestingly enough, had been an invalid for 38 years. We don't know how old he was. Maybe he was 38. Maybe it'd been his whole life. We don't know. But as ever, uh, numbers are significant in the Bible, and uh, just like names are significant in the Bible. And so the number 38, it's always helpful to think, where else in the Bible might the number 38 occur? What might be significant? Why is John particularly labelling 38 years? And if you go back to the story of Israel in the wilderness, what you find is once Israel was led out of captivity, they then wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, didn't they? That's quite close to 38. But what's interesting about those 40 years is the first two years, they journeyed to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Now, when they got to Kadesh Barnea, after two years, was the place that God said to them, now send some spies out into the promised land. And God's heart was always that they wouldn't wander in the wilderness and go round and round in circles, but they would go straight into the promised land. And they sent 12 spies out into the promised land. Two of them came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb, some of my heroes. Um, But the other 10 had a bad report, had a fearful report. And because of that, God judged them and said, you will now wander in the wilderness until the end of 40 years. Now, if this was after two years, that means that actually the time that Israel literally spent wandering in the wilderness was 38 years. And it was 38 years until a generation that had been faithless was left behind and a new generation could walk into the promised land. And here we have a cripple who'd been crippled for 38 years, but it's a time to leave behind his faithlessness. It's a time to enter into a whole new life. And that's what happens in this story. Now, what I find really interesting in this story is Jesus does what he does on a number of occasions. He starts by asking this man a question. And it seems like a crazy question to ask a man who's been an invalid for 38 years, because Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And I don't know if you've read, if you're familiar with the story of Bartimaeus, but Bartimaeus is a blind man who calls out to Jesus. Jesus stops and he says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And you kind of read that and you think, well, it's obvious. But actually, if Jesus asks a question, it's because there's something he wants to draw out from the answer that he receives. And the reality is Jesus already knew the answer to the question because Jesus is God. And there's a number of times in the gospel uh, where you get stories and it says that Jesus knew what people were thinking in their hearts. So Jesus didn't ask the man the question for his own benefit. Jesus asked the man a question because he was wanting to draw something out of the man. He was wanting to draw something out of his heart. What he was wanting to draw out from his heart was, have you got faith that something can change? Have you got faith that this might be a moment where transformation happens? And a couple of good quotes about change that I think are uh, worth reading uh, that will come up on a slide. But if you want something that you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done. Say that again. If you want something that you've never had, you must be willing to do something you've never done. In other words, doing the same thing over and over again will produce the same outcome. So this morning, if we want something to change, we must be tuned in and ready to consider doing something different, taking a step of faith, unhooking ourselves from a bit of history. We must be willing to do something different. And the second quote that's a really, really good quote, I think as well, we change our behaviour when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. Consequences give us the pain that motivates us to change. That's interesting, isn't it? Because basically what that quote says, that quote says, if you're comfortable and there's no consequences from staying where you are, you probably won't change anything. But actually, if there's pain, maybe the pain is a sign that something needs to change. Now, I believe this current season is more painful on many levels than any other season maybe we've ever lived through. What if God is wanting to highlight something through the pain 
and wanting to show us something that it needs to change, then actually we should be brave enough to welcome the pain, but to listen to what God is drawing attention to in the pain, because that may be a key for transformation. And Jesus was asking a question because he was wanting to draw something out of the man that would reveal something that Jesus was wanting to change. And it's really interesting, the man's answer, because remember the question that Jesus says to him, is he says, do you want to get well? Now, I think that's a yes or no question, really, isn't it? Do you want to get well? Not a difficult question. Should be a yes or no question. Really, really simple. Really, really straightforward. And yet, look at how the man responds. The man says, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool. Jesus didn't ask whether he had any friends or not. Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water's stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And if we keep those words up on the screen for a minute, just looking at that answer, what does that show you about where the guy was at? And we know physically he was an invalid, he was a paralytic, but what does that answer show you about where that guy was at on the inside? Jesus says, do you want to get well? The answer is either yes or no. And probably for most of us, the answer would be yes. And yet the answer he gets is an excuse for why he's not healed. And in that excuse, there's a revealing of a sense of isolation. There's a revealing of a sense of disappointment. There's potentially a revealing of a sense of self-pity but it's all revealed by the answer the man gives. Because you see, Jesus doesn't just want to heal the outer man. Jesus wants to change the state of his heart. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus says something that I think is really, really profound in Luke chapter six, verse 45. He says, out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. And if you want to really, really know what's going on in somebody's heart, listen to what comes out of their mouth. Because what comes out of their mouth will reveal what's going on in their heart. Which also means for us, what comes out of our mouth will reveal what we really believe or what we really think in our heart. And so the best way of indicating how well you're doing in terms of your heart, listen to what you say. You want to know how somebody else's heart is going on? Listen to what they say, because the mouth speaks what fills the heart. So in those moments of pressure, what comes out of your mouth? When you get that email that you'd rather not receive, What comes out of your mouth? When you make a mistake and you feel bad about yourself, what comes out of your mouth? When you get angry with someone, what comes out of your mouth? Because what comes out of your mouth will actually reveal what comes into your, what what is in your heart. Right the way through this uh, period, we've had uh, staff uh, Zoom calls Uh, We used to do it every single day to begin with because we felt like we needed that to be together and journey together. Now we're doing it twice a a week. We do it on a Monday morning, on a Wednesday morning. We regularly ask, how's one another doing? Through the course of this six, seven months, at one point or another, everybody has had a meltdown moment. And a number of us have had more than one meltdown moment. In those meltdown moments, in your meltdown moments... What comes out of your heart? Because it will reveal something about your history. And I believe that God can work in this season to heal us from our history. If we're alert, if we've got open ears, if we're ready to receive what God wants to do in our lives. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes about the fact if anyone's joined to Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So you might be tuning in this morning and say, well, I dealt with all my history because when I came to Jesus, it all went. 
Well, in one sense it did, because all of our history, all of our sin uh, is wiped away in one go. But for many of us, there's an unraveling of our history that is an ongoing journey that we take with Jesus. And so while it is true that if anyone's joined to Christ, they're a new creation, I don't know that I'm fully joined with Christ yet. And that seems to be an ongoing journey. And Paul also writes, the same Paul who writes that phrase, also talks about being transformed from one degree of glory to another by the work of the Holy Spirit, which is the same Paul who talks about working out your salvation. And I believe there's an ongoing journey to uh, understanding our history and God revealing things that we need to step out of and helping us on that journey of getting free from some of the heart stuff. Now, when an event and a circumstance happens to us, or when a squeezing happens to us at the moment, when our hearts get squeezed, so these things pop up to the surface and they start to come out of our mouth. There's a lady called Brené Brown, and she's written a number of great books, um, uh, uh, Daring Greatly, uh, one of them. Um, uh, uh, and one of the things, a phrase that she's coined that she talks about in her books is the story I'm telling myself. Now, when we think about this paralytic, this paralytic has a story that he's telling himself. He's telling himself that an angel might come down and stir the waters, that someone will get healed in the moment, but the story he's telling himself is it won't be him. The story he's telling himself is someone else is going to get there first. The story he's telling himself is, is uh, God loves someone else more than he loves him. The story he's telling himself is he's never going to get healed. And so when Jesus asks him the question, do you want to get well or not? Actually, what it reveals is the story that he's telling himself. The truth is, for many of us, for all of us, out of our history and out of our experiences, we all have a story that we're telling ourselves. And that story that we're telling ourselves is like a lens that we view the world through. And if that lens isn't clear, it will distort how we view the world and that will then distort how we react to situations and circumstances, and in particular, how we react under seasons of pressure, because there's a story that we're telling ourselves. So if I think about my life, okay, uh, let's personalise it, um, but I'm the youngest of three boys. Um, I was a surprise to my uh, mom and dad, um, and I don't think I was entirely welcomed or celebrated over when I arrived in the world. And so I've always carried under the surface a sense that, um, that maybe I was a bit of a disappointing, disappointment, and so I needed to prove myself or earn my way. And so for me, the way that worked out is, is I worked really, really hard at school to prove that I was not just as good as my brothers, my older brothers, but actually better than my older brothers. And the story I was telling myself was I had to earn or prove that I was lovable, and I had to prove I was better than other people to be able to compensate for an inner lack that I had. And it was a story that I was telling myself. And so unless I was top of the class, unless I performed really well, the story I told myself is I was a failure. But what that tipped me into is I have to work hard to succeed, otherwise I'm not lovable. And when I became a Christian, it was a number of years later that God confronted me with that, and I had to invite God into it and unravel it to find his healing. And even now, I still have to guard against it, but the truth is, I am unconditionally loved by God. If I gave up leading Restore Tomorrow, I don't plan on doing that, but if I did, I'm not loved according to the number of people that tune in to our live stream on a Sunday morning. I'm not loved according to the number of people who call themselves a part of Restore Community Church. I'm not loved according to what name I have, what role I have, what position I have. I am unconditionally loved by God because he's a gracious father and he loves me anyway. And for me, I've had to unhook myself from a lie that was a story that I'm telling myself. What story are you telling yourself? Maybe you're a perfectionist. If you're a perfectionist, there'll be a driver under the surface that makes you that perfectionist. Maybe in these times that you can't achieve what you would want to achieve, God wants you to open up the heart issue of what is it that drives me to be a perfectionist. 
I know someone who's, uh, I'm the youngest of, of three boys, I know someone else who's the middle child. And um, in their family, the, it felt like the oldest child got a lot of attention. It felt like the youngest child got a lot of attention. There's a, there's a story, isn't there, about youngest children uh, being uh, the favourites. Um, obviously, that can't be true because I'm the youngest child, so that couldn't possibly be true of my life. Um, but because they're the middle child, they always felt overlooked and they felt the attention went to the oldest or to the youngest, but they were always overlooked. And whenever times of squeezing happened, they always felt like they were left out. They always felt like everyone was more important than them because they, they had a story that they were telling themselves, which was they're never seen when other people are. Knew someone else who um, was a, the, the child of an alcoholic. And uh, if you've grown up as a parent, as a child of someone who uh, struggles with a significant life issue like an addiction or a trauma or something like that. Obviously, one of the outworkings of that is the child ends up taking responsibility at a younger age than they were meant to because we're meant to grow through a pathway of taking responsibility and we're meant to have the protection and the covering of our parents. If that's lifted from one reason or another, then a child, in a sense, has to fend for itself. Um, and this uh, particular lady, actually, she ended up, in many ways, parenting her mother more than the other way around. And what that built into her was a sense of, I need to take responsibility for everyone else. And right from the earliest age, she couldn't remember a time that someone else took responsibility for her. It was always her taking responsibility for someone else. The story she was telling herself was, unless I do it, no one else will. Now, we all have stories that we're telling ourselves. What's interesting in this story is the paralytic has a story that he's telling himself, which is, it won't happen for me. I'm lonely. I'm on my own. There's no one to help me. And that was keeping him locked in his paralysis. And for many of us, we may not be physically paralyzed, but we're paralyzed from being the people that God made us to be because we're kept captive by some lies that we're believing under the surface. As the story goes on, the guy gets healed, but the Pharisees start getting really upset about it because it happened on a Sabbath. How could someone possibly heal on a Sabbath? You're not allowed to do that. They had a story that they were telling themselves, which was God doesn't work in those ways. They had a story they were telling themselves, which is we have a system of control and a position, and this is going to threaten it. And they reacted out of the story they were telling themselves instead of being open to God doing something new. What's the story you're telling yourself? And where this gets really tricky, but really important, is once we recognize the story that we're telling ourselves, then we need to be brave enough to lay it down and to ask God to help us to live a different way. There's a great cartoon that I found this week that I thought would be good to see in terms of this whole point. Um, but it's the choice that we have between staying with a reassuring lie or actually changing to an inconvenient truth. And this really illustrates that whole thing of how much am I prepared or how much do I really, really, really want to change? Because it's easy to stay with our reassuring lie because that's what we've lived with all our life. What if actually there's a truth that God wants us to exchange that lie for? And you see, what holds most of us in bondage to our history is not actually an event or a circumstance, although some of those are really key. It's the message we received. It's, it's what the event or the circumstance spoke into us. That's actually what holds us captive. And in the Bible, all the way through, we see there's a battle between lies and truth. So when God creates Adam and Eve and puts them in the garden, he tells them how to behave. He tells them they can eat from every tree, but they mustn't eat from one particular tree. When the devil turns up, he lies to them. He says, did God really say? And they fall for the lie, and then they lose God's best for them. 
And when Jesus in John chapter 7, just a couple of chapters on, talks about the devil, he talks about him being the father of lies and says there's no truth in him. And what the devil wants to do is keep us captivated by the stories that we tell ourselves, the lies that put us on the exclusion list. Do you realise this guy was on the exclusion list? This guy was, maybe Jesus can heal, but it won't be for me. The lie of the enemy is to put you on the exclusion list. Because if God's truth is true... It's true for us all. I'll say that again. If God's truth is true, then it's true for us all. And Jesus says in John chapter 8, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And for many of us, I believe in this season, in the squeezing, God wants to use that to reveal what's going on in our hearts. In those moments of squeezing, what comes out of your mouth? How many times have you called yourself stupid, a failure? This always happens to me. Why does no one care about me? Why am I last on the list? Why am I not safe when other people are? Why am I not? Do you know that's revealing something? about what's going on in your heart, and it's revealing something about the story that you're telling yourself. Now, when we do our Living Free course, which we do as a church, we're looking at a way that we can do this online, because I think it would be a really helpful thing to do over the next few months, because I think God's stirring or, or using the current situation to stir many of our stuff, and it would be great if we could get free from it. But we say the solution to this stuff is, is five R's, Five things that uh, consecutive steps all begin with the letter R. Number one, we need to recognise what's going on. If you have a story that you're telling yourself, if you have lies that you're coming under, if you have familiar things that trap you time and time again, God wants to give you in this season, I believe, a revelation moment that you recognise what's going on. Once you recognise what's going on, once you recognise the story that you're telling yourself, the lens that your history is meaning you view the world from, the reasons you put yourself on the exclusion list, God then wants you to repent. Repent means to say sorry. Now you might be watching this thinking, why do I need to repent? It was someone else that did the, the sin to me that put me in that situation. Well, do you know what you need to repent of? You need to repent of the fact that you've believed a lie and owned a lie and lived under it. And repentance isn't actually a, ha a heavy thing. It's actually a happy thing because it's a freeing thing. Repentant just means I'm saying sorry and I'm turning away from it. To repent means to turn 180 degrees. So it means I've been living this way, I'm believing this lie. Oh my goodness, I'm going to turn away from that. I'm going to live a different way. So it's the way that we disconnect from our lie. We then need to receive God's grace. We need to receive God's forgiveness. We need to receive God's cleansing. We then need to rebuke the enemy, take a stand against the enemy, say I'm not going to live under God's, uh, I'm not going to live under the enemy's lies anymore. And then we need to replace them with God's truth. So five R's, I need to recognise, I need to repent, I need to receive, I need to rebuke the enemy, and I need to replace them with God's truth. Now on the chat stream uh, this morning, uh, the uh, chat hosts are going to put a link to Craig Rochelle. He leads the uh, biggest church in America, Life Church in America. He's an interesting guy, I, I think, in many ways. He's a great leadership teacher, but I think he is very driven, if I dare say that, on a live stream. I'll probably get criticised for that, but anyway. Um, he comes across as a very strong type A leader, um, very focused um, in, in some ways, uh, like I say, potentially could be. I'm not making a judgment, though, because that would be wrong. Um, could be um, quite a driven character. He says the single most powerful discipline that's changed his life is truth declarations. And he's gone through this process of recognising there's a story that he's telling himself, recognising that the lies that he's believing. He's repented of them, he's received God's forgiveness for them, he's rebuked the enemy, but then he's taken a number of truth declarations. And I've printed out some of these on a sheet here, you won't be able to see them, but if you go to the link on Life Church, you can uh, watch some of his videos on it. 
But every day when he gets up, he declares truth. And he says, because of Jesus, I'm a child of God. Because of Jesus, I'm a spiritual contributor, not a consumer. Because of Jesus, I'm alive. Because of Jesus, I'm a faith-filled, life-speaking, fully devoted follower of Christ. Because of Jesus, I'm Christ's ambassador. Because of Jesus, I'm a masterpiece. Because of Jesus, I'm content in Christ alone. Because of Jesus, I'm chosen. Because of Jesus, I'm determined to love God and people with everything I have. Because of Jesus, I'm a child of God. Because of Jesus, I'm strengthened by God who upholds me, protects me, defends me. Because of Jesus, I'm joyful. Because of Jesus, I'm gentle. Because of Jesus, I'm not easily offended and I will not hold on to bitterness. Because of Jesus, I'm patient. Because of Jesus, I'm faithful. Because of Jesus, I'm self-controlled. Because of Jesus, I'm kind. Because of Jesus, I was known even before I was born. Because of Jesus, I'm steady. Because of Jesus, I'm not alone. God is with me. Because of Jesus, I am loved. Because of Jesus, I'm fierce in confidence and boldness. Because God is with me. Because of Jesus, I am free. Because of Jesus, I am healed. Because of Jesus, I am not ashamed. And you could feel the difference as you were hearing those words spoken. I could feel the difference as I was declaring those words because I was stepping out of the lies that were saying, you're excluded, you're not important, you're not valuable. And I was exchanging those lies for the truth. And what Craig does every morning is he stands up and he declares truth over his life. And as he does it, something rises up within him and he steps out of his history into his destiny, into the reality that God has for him. Maybe in the same way that Jesus talks to the paralytic and he says take up your pallet get up and walk and for many of us Jesus has opened a doorway even in this season where we can leave behind our infirmity we can leave behind our failure we can leave behind the stories that we've been telling ourselves and we can choose to stand up and take hold of God's word and say I am a child of God God has given me everything that I need God has called me to be significant God has got a calling over me. God has made me be a wonderful mother. God has made me to be a wonderful father. God is going to provide everything I need. And as we stand in the truth, so we start to rise up and leave behind our history of paralysis. So we step out of our failure. So we step out of our captivity. So we step into our freedom. And for many of you this morning, this is a time you need to take something off. You can see a picture of people and it's like you're wearing a cloak. And the cloak is lies that you've let rest on you. And some of those lies have said you will never break the power of this. And there's some people you're watching this morning and you've sat under depression. And the lie of the enemy is you'll never get free. You'll never get free. A bit like the guy in the pool. You'll never get free. It's not true for you. 38 years, this will never change. Let me tell you, that is a lie. And in Jesus, you can shake off that cloak. For some people, I think there's physical healing and and infirmity that you've sat under and you've thought, it's too late. It's never going to happen to me. To those some people, and you've been sitting under shame, there's some stuff that's gone on in the past and you've thought, if someone else really knew this, I would be undone. I would be exposed. There's no way I can recover from that. Let me tell you, that is a lie. And this morning, God is wanting to rewrite your story. This guy could not get into the pool because he had no one to help him. Do you know what? The pool, the living water of of God, came to him and reached him. You may feel like you're not able to reach the pool this morning. Let me tell you, the living water of God is able to come out. The living water of God is able to reach you. We cannot physically gather. You cannot be in the same room as me. You cannot be in this pool but the living water of the Spirit of God can meet with you right now in your bedroom, in your lounge, in your community. The living water of God is not bound. Why not take a moment and invite that living water of Jesus to come and meet you right here, right now? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. I want to ask you, Will you stand with me, wherever you are right now? Will you stand? Put down your iPad, put down your laptop, put down your computer. Stand with me. 
Let's make a choice. We're not going to live as invalids anymore. We're not going to live as paralytics anymore. We're not going to live under our history anymore. Like I say, I saw a picture of a, a number of us, I think a lot of us, and it's like we've got a weighty garment over us. And it looks a bit like a dust cloth. And you know that um, furniture in houses that have been locked up for a while, it's like they cover them in dust cloth. And it feels like this last season, the enemy has been able to drop a dust cloth on us. And it's kind of deadened us, and it's limited us, and it's restricted us. Let me tell you, we need to recognize the strategy of the enemy. And as we recognize it, we need to repent of listening to and believing the lies. We need to repent of the believing the lies that we're not good enough. We need to repent of believing the lies that we're not going to make it through this season. We need to repent of believing the lies that God's not bigger than COVID. We need to repent of believing the lies that things will never change. We need to repent of believing the lies that God, that Jesus isn't bigger than all of this stuff. I don't know what lie you've been living under. I don't know what lies you've been living under. But as we stand together in the presence of God, let's start confessing them. Let's start repenting of them. And this is an active thing. It's not a passive thing. You know, no one uh, in another household can hear what you're confessing. I've had moments in this last season where I've thought, is this worth it? The things that I've hoped for, the things that I've dreamed for, am I really going to see them? And you know, I need to repent of those things. I need to repent of if thinking those words. I need to repent of declaring them. And as I do, I'm taking off that dust cloth. I'm uh, throwing off those words. I'm letting go of the lies. I'm letting the, the, the deadening of the enemy drop off my life. And Lord, I repent of every lie of the enemy that I've agreed with. Lord, I want to repent of the stories that I've told myself that are not you stories. Lord, I want to repent of the moments I've put myself and let myself be on the exclusion list. I want to repent, Father, of the times that I've said unhelpful words and spoken, uh, Lord, words of cursing over myself, actually. Father, I want to repent of that. And Lord, I pray that you will uh, wash me of that right now. Lord, I pray that you wash us of that right now. And Father, where the enemy's strategy is to weigh us down, Father, we take authority over the enemy right now. We rebuke him and we rebuke his lies. And we say, you will not hold down God's people anymore. And we shake off those lies. We say, you will not find a resting place. You will not hold us down anymore. And we make a decision to step out of those, the, those lies and to step into the truth that we are overcomers in Jesus, that we are healed in Jesus, that we are courageous people in Jesus, that we are the people of God. And we're going to see transformation come in our lives, in our communities, in our neighbourhoods, in this nation, in this world, that we're part of an overcoming army. And we choose to pick up the truth, the, the sword of the Spirit, the truth of God's Word. And we say we're known by God, we're significant by God. We have the power to overcome in Jesus. And we choose to root ourselves in the truth. And to step out of our history and to step into a new story, the Jesus story. The victory story, the hope story, the love story. We choose to step into that right now. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. And the worship team are going to pick up. They're going to start to uh, lead us in worship. As they do, just invite the Holy Spirit to come. Just invite the Holy Spirit to come. I think for some of us, we're physically, you need to uh, walk. You need to physically make a choice to step out of something. And so take a step forward, take a step forward, because it's a sign of I'm going to leave something behind. For other ones of us, you actually need to start walking around your living room and you need to start singing out and declaring out God's work. You need to start speaking out, saying, I am an overcomer, I am healed, I'm bigger than this in Jesus. I, I have the power in Jesus to be complete. I have the power in Jesus to see this overcome. I have the power in Jesus to leave behind this depression. As we worship, start declaring God's word, start entering into to God's word. If you want someone to pray for you, click the, the live button and uh, someone will pray with you. But let's start engaging with God and stepping into the healing and the freedom that he has for us today. Let's worship Jesus.